construction route, I think most of you, or some of you are going to be disappointed. <laughs> if you, uh, because I'm not going to tell you what sustainable urban development is. But then again, some of you might be, come up with new ideas what it could be from certain angles and so on, so on this perspective. Obviously because it's, each one of these words, sustainability, urban and development are highly complex. Put these together, <laughs> no idea what it is. Um, okay, framework of the presentation looks something like this. Scrutinizing the concept, as I told, we'll spend a few minutes there. Then try to import some ideas or perspectives from ge human geography, and specifically, specifically the mm -hmm. concept of city or urban, because maybe that's, I have some idea how that is uh, discussed within geography and we leave, leave the development and the sustainability out in this, this, this narrowing down. Uh, then I try to bring some context, uh, context to, the, to the concept through three different lines of research, which I have been doing previously, which I think are related to development. Geography of uh, happiness, in other words, uh, well-being and subjective well-being could be related to the topic. Uh, socioeconomic geography of climate change attitudes, which relate to broader discussion about the geography of political agency and attachment and development of these processes within, within Europe. And uh, third case, which I know the least of these three topics, but I'm familiar of the, of the uh, city region on discussion within the political geography context because I have been working with political geographers before. So there's some, some ideas which can be imported as well. Try to conclude it somehow. Let's see. Uh, starting with the definition, because we would like to know what sustainable urban system is. So I Googled, as researchers do, but they want to find the information. Uh, this one is from a uh, National Academy of Sciences in the US. So it's supposed to know what things are in, in the society. Uh, I think this is obviously, I think it's a huge disappointment as a, as a definition because that's basically the definition of um, sustain, sustainability copied from the Brundtland report. Just put word urban in the front. Basically, it's the, just the sustainability. But yeah, then it's urban. Okay, but that's that's a nice try, obviously. Yeah. Oh, do we have a, okay, okay, yeah. Um, next option is put very difficult and complex words <laughs> enough. And then uh, let's see what then happens. High order understanding, trans boundary, multi sectoral, multi scalar solutions sustainability and healthy future. So it's like a political program of some party, perhaps, happiness and prosperity for all. But there are some, some, uh, some uh, characteristics of this, this definition which uh, resonate to geography, maybe the transboundary idea, that cities cannot be studied as a standalone concept, as islands there. And some knots in a network or kind of uh, within the uh, uh, kind of uh, mm -hmm. network of cities, uh, spaces or flows, as they say. A few more definitions. Uh, doesn't really bring much more concrete to the table. Resiliency needs to be also mentioned. It's another fast word which can be used. Uh, sustainable urban systems are those that are transforming their structures and processes within the goal of measurably advancing the well-being of people and planet. We can kind of grasp this definition from a concept of well-being because that's, that's been a, a key concept in my research and obviously the concept of well-being relates to the process of uh, development, some kind of a temporal process well, usually well-being increases. Well-being is related to the uh, city, obviously, as well. 
is there more well-being in a city compared to other regions or, or less? Okay, it's a difficult, difficult concept and I will focus on one part of this, one word in the concept of sustainable urban development, which is the urban or the city. And one could kind of assume that geographers would know what city is, uh, urban geographers would have a clear idea what city is, but of, of course this is not the case. It's very, very complex uh, concept as well. Uh, this is a, I think this is quite good attempt to capture what CD is actually. I'd be using this, this definition in, uh, in my teaching. A settled community of substantial size and population density that shelters a variety of non-agricultural specialists, including a literate elite. Of course, you can see that the, this goes way back to the history because when we discuss what is city, we need to kind of understand what are the kind of reasons why cities originally emerged. Uh, and a settled community, obviously, that's obvious. And, uh, but one of the kind of the controversial issue here is the substantial size and population density, because of course this is very sensitive to scale, and this is the scale being used. I think there are jokes about whether Tampere is a city, because when Tampere emerged with the Maalaiskunta, same happened in Rovaniemi. The land area of the city is so huge when you can calculate the average population density, then it's not dense enough. So it's about the, the governmental unit, which is considered to be a city, and question of scaling. Uh, non agricultural specialist is a good definition because, uh, regardless of the historical context or period of time, cities are always locations where the division of labor is is uh, very developed. So there are professions in cities and occupations which can only exist within the city because there are obviously markets for smaller sectors. A uh, little bit elite cities have always been some sort of central of governance of political power. In history the clergy and gentry then the bureaucrats and politicians and my own kind of addition is here that and it's kind of open question whether the innovators, startup entrepreneurs and urban influencers have some sort of power at the moment which is concentrated on the cities. Of course, if, if we think about power or culture, we can refer to borders capital. So it's obviously that cultural capital is concentrated in cities. It's usually connect, connected or converted into political power as well. And this comes, kind of already starts to relate to the concept of city regionalism. What kind of individuals are we interested nowadays in this urban economy? Okay, uh, even though this is quite good uh, definition, it leaves out one central aspect of the city, which is culture and cultural dimension. Do cities have a specific culture which differentiates them from the surrounding society? Uh, society kind of uh, territory. And then we need to obviously go, go to the origins of these kind of discussions and we end up with uh, guys like Simmel, Durkheim and Tönnies, which are originally developed in the intersection of sociology and geography. Uh, I'm trying to sum up the whole, whole literature in one slide, so, but but basically one of the key features is that urban is always a paradox. There's a spatial density, people and businesses relate close to each other, but then again, the social distances can be kind of huge in a city. Uh, paradox of uh, uh, relatedness, social relatedness. Uh, in general, the argument of these guys towards cities at large a negative one. There's a variation where the CML was maybe the most negative regarding the social uh, social effects of urban life, but in general they had a different aspect than the economies to the city. The social life in cities has carries a negative effect to the well-being of, of individuals. Uh, another useful frame uh, idea of this broad discussion is that Urbanization can be related as a parallel process to modernization. There are something similar features of urban and modern. 
for example, the division of labor. When, when societies develop, the division of labor becomes more diverse and specialized. And related to that, urban as a continuum, because it's not, a, it's not very useful to look at these urban rural as a dichotomy. Instead, there's more urban or more development in sort the of location and then there's a gradient which fades away or increases in certain kind of uh, environments. Okay, first intermission, what have we learned? Obviously, the concept seems to be that the urban development and uh, well-being are somehow related. We don't really know how, but they are discussed within the same concept or say the same frameworks. And there are multiple perspectives, how to, uh, perspectives from which to approach the concept of uh, well-being and city. I will take just a few obvious ones. The argument or perspective by economists, spatial or urban economists, relate, uh, see the city as uh, eventually a positive and also natural process. More urbanization, bigger cities, more happiness will follow in terms of monetary well-being and uh, economic growth. Uh, then again, kind of uh, controversial argument can be uh, found from the urban sociology, urbanist way of social and cultural life, which carries a negative effect to the social organization of uh, populations in cities. So we have kind of interesting uh, uh, perspectives to the concept of city and development and well-being. And this is a bridge to, to my topic of research, which I have been maybe mostly focusing on in the previous work, which is the geography of well-being, or maybe in broader terms, just the happiness studies, which usually, obviously, is a very broad kind of line of research and includes all the theoretical discussion from the ancient, ancient Greek philosophers, but what I'm mostly interested in and have been doing research is the empirical side, and then we are talking about the survey research, or the self-evaluated measures of well-being of the individuals themselves. And then we can discuss, think of this field as a distinction between the subjective and objective. Subjective is always evaluated by individuals themselves, and objective is something uh, evaluated externally by a researcher or politicians or, or policy makers. And uh, within this distinction, the most usual measures have been money and happiness, because this, this is kind of the question which pops up in the public discussions and uh, also within uh, scientific analysis. Does money lead to happiness? Possible, but also the causality might be the other way. But nonetheless, money and well-being are obviously related in the common discussions, but also within this empirical lead, uh, field of research. Uh, most famous and dominating uh, theme in this, this context is the framed as the Easterling paradox. And then we are looking at the average happiness or life satisfaction within a country uh, in relation to the GDP, the monetary well-being, the measure of uh, macro and economic production in the country. You can just do, since you have the data, you can just look simply the correlation between those variables. And the Easterland paradox is uh, kind of the finding that they do correlate in the cross-sectional analysis within certain period, certain time, but when you look at the development in the true time, uh, within, uh, within one country, the, the happiness does not increase, the GDP increases. But this is the picture of the few cross-sectional correlation in one year. So those of you who are somehow informed on the 
uh, quantitative analysis, you can clearly see that there is a correlation. Not totally linear, but nonetheless, there is a correlation between the uh, average life satisfaction and GDP per capita. This is the most discussed kind of a scale of analysis within this literature. We are doing a comparison between countries. And this is just showing the easterlin products that even though there's a cross sectional correlation, the through time the happiness does not increase when the GDP increases. But we are more interested on the smaller scale of analysis, kind of zooming in from the, the country scale, which is the, usually the default spatial scale within social science. The most simple way to do geography or regional studies is to say that we can have smaller geographical units than countries. Let's look more in more detail and we can find regions or cities. And then again, the same question applies. How do the objective and subjective well-being correlate uh, within country scale? In other words, are there interregional or urban rural differences in the subjective well-being? Uh, and the interesting finding in this, this uh, literature is that when we look at the urban rural differences within a country, and in the context of developed societies, we can see that the cities, which usually are the most richest, highest GDP, have the lowest subject to well-being in terms of life satisfaction. So kind of the pattern is reversed in a cross-section analysis. And this is very interesting, obviously, and this has been documented in the literature quite a lot, but the reasons behind it are still pretty much open why this, this is the case. Uh, there are lots of uh, possible explanations. One of them is that uh, people are, are in different locations regarding their personal values. There's a concept of value dissonance within the social psychology which can be applied here. In urban, urban uh, uh, context, there are different values which the individual possibly have since she or he or she has moved from the urban areas to the cities and there's a dissonance and this causes the negative that's one explanation uh, but nonetheless this is uh, from our own work just documenting what i said before in a in the table that within a developed context western europe north america we have a negative effect of living in cities whereas in a, in a global sense, uh, the effects are positive. This is kind of simple empirical finding, but what would this possibly mean for the concept of sustainable urban development, and of course related social policies or regional policies or urban policies? Okay, then we have the obvious fact that it might be that the urbanization, bigger cities, more uh, more cities. Uh, is not increasing increasing the subjective well-being of the population. Of course, there are open questions before we can actually provide these kind of policy recommendations. But at least there's some some kind of uh, disclaimer available. We don't know if it's uh, just a place-based effect. Do actually cities make people unhappy, or are cities just a concentration of unhappy people? Empirically, there are two different different. Uh, different uh, explanation, of course, which lead to very different policy recommendations. We are ever going to make any. Also, we don't know if the, all the population segments are affected equally. And uh, we don't know if other measures than, uh, than, than the ha life satisfaction show very similar patterns. And also, we don't know actually what's the threshold level. What is it? What, how developed a society needs to be for this kind of pattern to emerge. That one either. So there's lots of uh, research still to be done. Uh, second line of research of my current and uh, uh, past work. Uh, with Sanna, we made a manual article looking at the socioeconomic geography of climate change attitudes. And uh, one 
kind of anchor how we write the position this analysis within the sustainable sustainable sciences is a remark from a plastic barker if one if one wants to explain an action he should go to the place where it occurs and this kind of uh, comment uh, emphasizes the importance of geography obviously geography geography might matter but also more general context so context matters. and these are arguments with geographers like with the sociologists as well take a kind of context instead of looking for universal behavior patterns which uh, maybe psychologists and economists are more keen on finding so geography and uh, kind of uh, well-being context individual do these affect the attitudes of on towards climate change and then also we are kind of more interested within this framework on the supply uh, uh, demand side solutions for sustainability the supply side is usually just interested in the technical solutions provided to the market and, uh, with the assumption that people people will adapt those immediately but we are looking whether people have actually resources to, and interest to engage this kind of behavior uh, more explicitly we examined the four concepts climate change skepticism concern and pro uh, pro environmental norm and willing, willingness to engage in the energy safe behavior two questions do these have a geographical variance within a country between urban rural and second question, can this be explained with the individual level deficits in well-being domains? We had four indicators on that. Experienced economic hardship, life satisfaction, and active and passive unemployment. Uh, results in a simple form are here. Uh, and we actually see, interestingly, we see a gradient. We, have, we see clear differences between the urban and rural regarding the skepticism. In other words, people believe that climate change is reality more in cities and less in, in countryside. And these effects are actually uh, independent from socioeconomic characteristics of individual and also human values. So this is kind of. Uh, quite a heavily controlled results, and yet we can see clear geographical differences. And concern is kind of reverse pattern. People are more concerned in cities and less in rural contexts. But then again, this uh, uh, smaller skepticism and higher concern is not converted in a higher personal norm in a city. So there's yet another paradox there. Uh, then looking at the uh, subjective well-being domains, there are some significant estimates here, but these are the strongest one, which uh, show us that being un unemployment and not looking for work has a very negative effect for individual to de uh, develop a pro environmental personal norm or actually engage in energy saving behavior. So what do these results possibly mean to the sustainable urban development or systems? Uh, there are geographical differences. Geography is always happy to say that, have evidence that geography matters, even if it would be a smaller estimate, but if it's significant, we can say that geography matters. Uh, and also the well-being domains kind of matter the other other argument for us for doing this kind of analysis is that perhaps the level of uh, well-being of individual matters for the attitudes and uh, development of personal norm for energy creating consumption and all, we can see that it does matter Subjective economic hardship and especially being unemployed, unemployed and being passive have a very, a very strong predictor for low, low norm. Uh, and this can be 
framed these findings in a way that being socially and spatially excluded from the society has a, a specially negative effect. Of course, in technical terms, this would refer to some kind of interaction effect between location and subject well-being. And we found some, some evidence of the interaction in these terms. Uh, but this, uh, these results also relate to a broader discussion within uh, human and economic and political geography. And that is the discussion which has been presented as the revenge of places left behind, which is a very topical issue nowadays in, in geography. And the key idea is that the political participation and the attachment has a very strong geography. And for example, the visible results of these differences is the kind of distribution and support for populistic parties and in general anti-establishment attitudes, which are more common in very general terms, more common in rural and peripheral areas and in cities. So also these, these results on the climate change attitudes are, at least in my view, leading to this broader discussion about the geography of political attachment to that the political agency or agency in general of population. There will be population in rural areas which feel somehow left behind or left out of the uh, kind of political discussion, but also on the, on the concept and measures of development. Uh, regarding policies, one could say that based on these results, it's clear that kind of uh, sectoral policies, like a social, environmental, regional, should be somehow discussed within the same framework or kind of in sync, or at least be, be aware of, the, of what's going on in the other, other sectoral policies. I think I will skip this just since. How much time do we have? Are we critical on the time issue? <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just, yeah, this is some further evidence on the geography of uh, this content. Let's put it that way. Because there are bits and pieces in my empirical work where I have found out that the results pointed the same direction. But geography matters. There is something going on between the urban and rural, which is kind of a bit, uh, divergence. The tensions between the city and the non-city are kind of increasing. This is just empirical evidence of that, but of the last part of the presentation maybe elaborates this, this uh, tension also. Let's move, move to that. As I said, this is maybe the field which I'm least informed about. But we are going to have a commentary from the wise critical political geographers in the back, back row after this. Uh, but nonetheless, I think they also agree that the concept of city regionalism is relevant in this context as well. And especially when we focus on the, the agendas for carbon neutral cities. Uh, but first, what is city regionalism? It's a range of argumentation, arguments and argumentation types by policymakers, politicians, planners, and consultants. And the key, key argument maybe is that cities have replaced the states as the key actors within the world economy and politics. Uh, Another fancy word, socio-spatial imaginary, which is very much included in this, this kind of argumentation. It's in line with the competitive narrative and very much related to the geography of knowledge intensive economy. And also it's usually presented with the arguments of depolitization of politics 
politics in general, but here in this context, the regional politics. Uh, going in more detail to the carbon neutral ag agendas of the cities, which obviously are positive. It's, it's a positive sign that any agent or institution takes these things seriously. But kind of the, the critical view on these agendas is placed to the fact that in this narrative, the cities are presented as apolitical, non-political, pragmatic and flexible actors, which can somehow solve the problems with the nations, national governments were not able to do. Uh, it's very much in line with empowering local communities, which in technical terms means that we need a stronger zoom, just look at the smaller geographical areas and something good will happen. And more local communities involved and they are more aware of the important discussions. Uh, what does, what does this, this mean in practice? One example, which is a very good one in terms of the title as well. Sorry about the language, it's in, it's in Finnish, but basically it says that the competition of uh, Helsinki is no longer a uh, countryside, but it's the state of Finland. This is very provocative argument, as the titles usually are, but it's really going fast and far. Uh, another argument which is made here is that uh, the problem of the states is that they are stick to nationalism and uh, party politics. So cities are presented as neutral, neutral, non-political actors, which can solve 